know, I'm, I, don't, I don't know about you, but I'm kind of in awe of the quality of the science that you're hearing, uh, that, I, that I'm hearing be, uh, before me. Um, the, um, uh, and I want to emphasize one thing before I give a very, very brief capsule on, on some of the work that we're doing. Uh, is that uh, it's not just supporting great scientists, it's supporting connections between great scientists. And that's the, that's the one thing that you can get when you have security in funding, when you know that you're going to be able to give out uh, grants and form a team, that then people can spontaneously start to work together. And you're hearing common themes. Um, we didn't choose these speakers because they're connected. We could have taken any of our uh, investigators and had them present, and you will find your own connections between genes that make cells divide and, and experimental systems so we can study them, genes that uh, may stop cells from becoming cancerous, tumor suppressor genes, and how we can find them, the relationship between uh, obesity, inflammation, and, and cancer, cancer predisposition, the influence of, uh, of uh, the environment, especially things that we do to, 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 to ourselves, such as overeating, for example, that may uh, influence uh, the activity of uh, predispositions because of, of um, uh, abnormal genes, uh, and the various chemicals that provide the signals that make all these things sort of come, come together. Uh, and so it's not just really individual experiments, which have to be done with, with a very focused vision, a very tunnel vision to, uh, to, to accomplish their very sophisticated goals, but then you take a lot of tunnels and you put them together and then you have a big roadway. And that's really what we're trying to accomplish uh, by what we're doing. And nobody else is really doing this yet, but people are starting to actually uh, to duplicate this, this, uh, this approach in other diseases um, uh, and uh, in other areas. And we think that this has been productive for us and uh, will be productive for science in general. Uh, my own specific orientation, in addition to being a cancer physician and what's called a clinical trialist, um, uh, as, as uh, is uh, many, three of my colleagues sitting at the table are clinical trialists who actually do trials uh, trying to improve prognosis of patients. But my own particular area of scientific expertise is mathematics and biomathematics. I actually started in music, and music is all about converting noise into order, uh, and mathematics is all about converting a diversity of observations, a diversity that don't make sense individually, into something that makes sense collectively. And when I was extremely young and had a full head of hair, actually, I think I lost my hair by that point, Mark, you'll have to remind me. And when Mark and I worked together, and he was my attending at the National Cancer Institute, I became fascinated by the fact that cancers and pretty much everything else that grows, grows by a very discrete mathematical process called Gompertzian growth, discovered in the early 19th century by Benjamin Gompertz. And it's an S-shaped curve. You think the way your own children grow, or the way that you grew from a child, where you start to grow very quickly when you're very young, and then you start to tail off and reach a plateau phase where you're still growing, but at a very slow rate. And that, is, that, that can be described by an equation that was discovered by Benjamin Gompertz. And we actually applied that equation to design uh, better therapeutics for cancer, uh, better ways of using drugs, and that's a whole separate story because while this was all going on for many decades, uh, I was intrigued, uh, haunted by, okay, it's reproducible, things grow by that pattern, but why? What is the reason for it? And there were a lot of hypotheses and none of them really worked. None of them really made a lot of sense. Uh, and then a, an observation by a colleague of mine uh, in, in the laboratory, Jean Massaguet, um, uh, was, uh, was intriguing because he found a set of genes that seemed to predict which cancers would spread from the breast, mouse breast, to the lung. And those same genes caused more rapid growth of the tumor in the mouse breast. And he asked me, as a clinician, is it true that cancers that tend to spread also tend to be fast growing? And yes, indeed, it is true. But the intriguing thing was that none of these genes had anything to do with cell division uh, or cell death. They all had to do with the relationship of the gene and its environment, which is a, a common topic that you've heard uh, my colleagues discuss. And it occurred to me, from the mathematical point of view, that there would be an explanation for this if, indeed, the cancer cells, in addition to spreading to the lung, could spread back to the cancer itself. Because if it could spread back to the cancer itself, that would cause more rapid growth uh, and, and not necessarily increase cell division, just a collection of the cells of the cells coming back. And you think of it as weeds in your garden. The problem is not the weed. The problem is the weed bed, the collection of weeds and weeds seed new weed plants. And so the weed bed grows very fast, even though in each individual weed plant doesn't necessarily grow very fast. It seeds itself, it is a self-seeding process. 
It also, by the way, explains gram protein growth because as things grow, the ratio of their outside to their inside gets smaller, which is why mice have fur and elephants don't. I know you've all been treated by that question for your entire <laughs> lives, but the reason is that elephants have a very big volume relationship to their surface area. Mice, because they're small, have a very big surface area relationship to their volume, and therefore uh, they have to have fur to hold their heat in. Elephants don't. Uh, very large people need very light coats in the winter for the same reason. And so, um, uh, and, and so it actually, if the growth is from the outside in rather than the inside out, it would explain gram protein growth. Uh, the bottom line is that we, we hypothesized this and actually published the mathematics of it, uh, 2006, I believe, and just this year on Christmas Eve, uh, the definitive paper came out in a journal called Cell uh, that uh, showed that it was a true phenomenon in many systems with many different kinds of cancer, with many different kinds of cells, uh, and we are now exploring this in human disease as well uh, using sophisticated genetic tools to see the same process. Now, you, you, you see why I'm excited about this is because if you're going to be developing anti-cancer drugs, we are developing drugs that are influencing cell division. We are working on drugs that influence uh, inflammation. We're working on drugs that influence other processes. Now we can start to attack, develop drugs that attack the process of seeding. So it could lead directly to, uh, to, to therapeutics. And there are a lot of other aspects of this that I'm not going to be able to mention because of limitations of time. Um, what intrigues me about this research, in addition to um, uh, what I've already described, is the fact that it, it can start to connect the really seminal observations that are being made in other parts of the BCRF and in other parts of our community, uh, and try to build, use it to build together a comprehensive kind of mathematical knowledge of cancer that could allow us to intervene uh, in, a, in a very specific way. Uh, you know, you, you blow up a balloon and you let it go, it can fly in the air, of course, in a random fashion. You need mathematics to take that basic principle and make a rocket ship. And we are hoping that the mathematics of this that we develop are going to guide us into, into ways that we can utilize these, these tools. Uh, I emphasize again, as all my colleagues have emphasized, that these are the kinds of things that can only happen when you have scientific freedom and, and the ability to be creative. Uh, the ability to use your imagination and go off in directions that may not be typical uh, directions or may not be conventional directions. And that is the kind of freedom that the BCRF offers my colleagues and myself and the kind of freedom that you give us by joining together and supporting this activity today. So I, I join my colleagues in thanking you so much for being here. And now I'd like to open this up to questions from the audience about anything you've heard or anything else um, uh, except the Super Bowl, which is over. <laughs> okay. Thank you.